Hi, I'm Sydney, the Program and Special Events Fellow at Food Recovery Network and resident food safety expert. Thanks for joining me to learn about how you can ensure the food you recover is safe, healthy, and dignified. We will go over personal safety, kitchen and farm etiquette, temperature danger zones, date labels, what is appropriate to donate, and a few other best practices in this video, including how to prevent the spread of COVID-19 while recovering food. At the end of the video, please complete the short quiz that goes over the main points we cover here to make sure you are prepared to recover food. Completing this quiz is required of all volunteers before they go on their first food recovery for the 2020-2021 school year. If you have any questions, email us at programs at foodrecoverynetwork.org or text us at the number listed on the screen. Let's get started. The number one reason to practice proper food safety is to prevent foodborne illnesses. While many foodborne illnesses are something people can bounce back from, the CDC estimates that each year 48 million people get sick from a foodborne illness, 128,000 are hospitalized, and 3,000 can die. Foodborne illnesses are caused by bacteria, parasites, or viruses, which can be controlled within a healthy level in food if proper safety guidelines are followed through the entire food supply chain, from agriculture to food service. The second reason to learn food safety is to protect your personal safety. There are steps and precautions you can take to ensure you and your teammates are safe when doing recoveries and handling food. This is especially important while COVID-19 is still a threat. While the virus is unlikely to be passed through food, it is highly contagious in the air. Therefore, we'll learn about ways to protect yourself and those around you from transmitting the virus while maintaining proper food safety. Being confident in food safety can help your recoveries go more smoothly and help to strengthen your partnerships with your food donor, who you collect food from, and your partner agency, who receives the recovered food, because you'll be able to guarantee that the food you recover is safe and dignified for redistribution. You may be familiar with the Bill Emerson Good Samaritan Food Donation Act. This was a bill passed into law in 1996 that states that any food donated in good faith, which means that it has been determined safe by the donor and the recipient thanks to food safety practices, will not incur liability on the donor should anyone get sick. A synopsis of this act is that while doing food recovery, we will do no harm. Before we get into how to handle food safely, we need to talk about personal safety. Check in with yourself before you go on a recovery. Have you had any of the key symptoms of coronavirus or tested positive in the past 14 days? These include fever, cough, difficulty breathing, fatigue, muscle and body aches, headache, loss of taste or smell, sore throat, congestion, runny nose, nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea. Have you had any other symptoms of illness in the past 24 hours? If so, please find someone else to replace you at the recovery. Do you have any open wounds or sores? Make sure any lesions are covered with a clean bandage and a disposable glove if they're on your hand. Dressing appropriately can keep you safe from contracting COVID-19 and safe in the kitchen. Wear closed-toed shoes with your hair securely tied back and a hat or hairnet. No jewelry, and don't forget to wear your cloth or medical face mask at all times. Finally, whenever you can, maintain six feet of distance or more from other people. This may mean less volunteers can recover at one time, but it's especially important to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Once you've checked in with your health, checked your temperature, and have all of the right attire and personal protective equipment, you can arrive at the kitchen or food recovery site. As soon as you do, make sure you wash your hands for 30 seconds or more, all the way up to your elbows with warm water and soap. Fully drying your hands is important too. It's always a good time to wash your hands while recovering food, but you must wash your hands at the beginning of every recovery if you touch your face, hair, clothes, face mask, phone, raw meat or eggs, dirty dishes, or trash, and after sneezing, going to the bathroom, coughing, eating, drinking, and when replacing gloves. This may seem like a hassle, but hand washing is one of the best ways to prevent the spread of foodborne illnesses and will help keep you safe from contracting COVID-19. If you are recovering food in a kitchen, be sure to identify yourself to the kitchen staff and listen to them for instruction. General good practices in a kitchen include wearing gloves when handling food, keeping your phone away, and communication. It can feel silly, but yell behind when passing someone in the kitchen or hot when moving a container of hot food. This can prevent serious injuries and is expected of all kitchen staff, which now includes you. When handling knives, never fully submerge a knife in a tub of water or sanitizer so that when the next person reaches their hand in, they don't accidentally grab the blade. 
If you're walking with a knife, hold it so it's pointed at the ground with your arm glued to your side. There's absolutely no running or horseplay allowed in the kitchen. If you are gleaning or recovering food on a farm or in a community garden, treat the land and crops with respect and kindness. Listen to the farmer, ask what is appropriate to harvest, and only to take as much as they say to. Leaving a space better than you found it is a great way to be asked back to glean again. Ask the farmer if you can pull a few weeds or collect spoiled co crops for composting while you work. In terms of personal safety, make sure you have sunscreen, a hat, and access to fresh drinking water. Wearing long sleeves and long pants is a good idea too to prevent scrapes and bug bites while gleaning. Closed-toed shoes and cloth or medical face masks are still required to prevent the spread of COVID-19, even if you are rec recovering outside. Always wash your hands before handling food. It's a good idea to bring hand sanitizer with you in case potable water and soap is not available for frequent hand washing. Do not eat food in the field. Wait until you can properly wash it and the gleaning is done. Then only do so in designated areas to prevent contamination. Remember, you are a guest in these spaces, both farms and kitchens, and should ask permission and take cues from those whose space you are sharing. With dining services changing due to the coronavirus, your chapter may be recovering more prepackaged food than before. This may make things simpler for your recoveries, but there are still several safety measures to follow. First is keeping track of shelf life and date labels. Prepackaged meals will likely come with a sell by, best buy, or use by date. Each of these dates means something different and are not usually based on exact science, not federally regulated, and can be marketing tactics. Despite all of the conflicting standards, discretion with date labels is extremely important when donating food. Sell by and best buy are labels used to indicate quality. If a food item is past this date, use reason to determine whether it is safe to consume. Shelf-stable products high in salt or sugar have a relatively long shelf life as do frozen products or canned or jarred foods with an acidic pH of 4 or below. Use by is still ambiguous, but generally regarded as the safety deadline or expiration date. Refrigerated products, meat, and dairy products are likely to spoil quickly. When it comes to date labels, you personally can take the liberties of eating food past the date on the packaging as a way of reducing food waste if it is safe to do so. When we're donating food, however, we need to be more cautious of these dates. Do some research on state regulations and talk with your partner agency on whether or not they accept sell-by and best-by food after its date. Never donate food past its use-by date. If you're in doubt of whether or not it's safe to donate, err on the side of caution and compost or throw it out. This is important to maintain the dignity of the clients you are serving and reduce the amount of food your partner agency has to waste. If the food you're recovering was packaged in bulk, each package may not have its own date label. If this is the case, ask your food donor to identify the date for the product and be sure to label the lot for your partner agency. Another way your food donor might be changing the way they distribute food is by providing hot or prepared foods in to-go containers. The best way to know whether or not this type of food is safe to donate is by understanding temperature danger zones. As we mentioned earlier, food contains certain levels of bacteria, viruses, or parasites, and the human body is equipped to handle consuming these at low levels. However, these foodborne illness causing microbes multiply when food is in the temperature danger zone, between 40 degrees and 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Food that is left in this zone for more than two hours is no longer safe to consume or donate. It's also important to make sure that food does not go from piping hot to the fridge or freezer right away. For example, if a pot of soup is held at 160 degrees Fahrenheit internally, but is put right into the fridge, the soup may only get cool enough to sit in the temperature danger zone all night as it slowly cools. Make sure any hot food is safely cooled to 40 degrees Fahrenheit internally before refrigerating or freezing. If it's a particularly hot day outside or your recovery transportation does not have air conditioning, be extra cautious of the length of time your recoveries take. Never allow meat, poultry, or seafood that requires refrigeration to sit at room temperature for more than one hour if the air temperature is above 90 degrees Fahrenheit. While temperature danger zones sound scary, there's an easy rule of thumb to remember. If you take food out of a fridge or freezer, it needs to go back into a fridge or freezer or heated and served within two hours. If you serve a hot dish, it needs to be cooled and refrigerated within two hours. Let's walk through the life of a buffalo chicken wrap to visualize how to avoid temperature danger zone. 
Imagine these are usually made to order in your cafeteria, but due to COVID-19, they are now assembled by staff in the morning, wrapped and available for students to pick up at lunchtime. Buffalo Chicken Wrap A is made in the morning with warm chicken, left out for students to pick up for the three hour lunch window with no temperature control. When no one chooses this sad wrap, it'll go into the fridge until you can come pick it up and deliver it to your partner agency. Buffalo Chicken Wrap B is made with pre-cooked and chilled chicken, wrapped completely in a food safe wrap and stored in a cool and dry place under 40 degrees Fahrenheit for up to five days until you can come pick it up and deliver it to your partner agency. Buffalo Chicken Wrap B is the one that's safe for recovery, and the issue here is the temperature danger zone. Wrap A was left out with no temperature regulation, therefore bacteria, viruses, and parasites that were dormant in and on the wrap had hours to multiply, contaminating the food. Even if it's refrigerated after sitting in the temperature danger zone and reheated before it is served, the wrap is still not good to donate. This slide shows the general shelf life of different packaged and prepared foods. There's no need to memorize this information since it can be a lot, but your chapter leaders have a flyer with all of these dates listed that you can print and post in your recovery space or bookmark on your phone to review before you recover. The most important one to know is that a prepared dish that has been refrigerated for five or more days is no longer safe to donate. Having the right recovery materials can make the recovery go smoothly and make taking safety precautions easy. When storing and transporting food, prepared food and ingredients should be stored in sealed containers that have been cleaned and sanitized and are clearly labeled with what is inside, including any allergen information, when it was made, when it expires, and how it should be stored. This can be one-time use aluminum pans, Tupperware containers, or even Ziploc bags. When storing and transporting fresh produce that you pick from a farm, use a clean and dry container with no cracks or holes at the bottom. Fresh produce can mold if it's in an airtight space, so do not place a lid on these containers. Examples of good containers for fresh produce are wax produce boxes, large plastic storage bins, and hardware store buckets. Never use biodegradable containers to transport food as they can sog and contaminate the food that they hold. If using a produce box like the one shown in the picture here, use only a clean and dry waxed box to carry produce and never a regular cardboard box. All food containers should be used exclusively for food and never store tools, supplies, or anything else when not carrying food. Knowing what food is safe and acceptable to recover is important when establishing a partnership with your food donor, but also important in everyday food recovery operations. Know the difference between quality and expiration dates, as we previously talked about, and always check for the date on packaged products. Food with packaging that has been tampered with is not safe to donate generally. If you recover from grocery stores, this might be a portion of the food they try to donate. Use your discretion when necessary to determine if something is safe. For example, is the cardboard box full of individually wrapped snacks part of the packaging that was damaged? Make sure none of the individual wraps have been compromised and check with your partner agency to see if they will still accept this donation. Dented cans from falls or other mishandling can be safe, but a dent in a can can also be created by a large presence of foodborne illness causing bacteria. Sharply dented cans should not be donated, but a bump in the lip of a can can be acceptable. Prepared food that is not safe to donate includes food that has been placed out on a buffet or taken out of a kitchen to be served, homemade foods, spoiled food, unpasteurized milk products or juices, food recovered after a power outage, and food past its shelf life. When considering what prepared food is safe to donate, keep in mind these things. Was it prepared in a certified commercial kitchen? Did it spend more than two hours in the temperature danger zone? Does it have signs of spoilage, including being past its expiration date? If you don't know the answer to these questions in regards to the recovered food, err on the side of caution and do not donate it to your partner agency. When gleaning or recovering fresh produce, never accept fruits that have broken skin or bruises. Never collect produce for, for donation that you found on the ground. You don't know how long it's been there or what it has been exposed to since falling from where it grew. Only accept fresh fruit off of a tree or vine and vegetables directly from their beds. In addition, only recover from farms that are upfront about their safe farming practices and wash produce in potable water only.
Once the food is packaged and the produce is harvested, the food safety precautions are still not done. Stack containers in a way that will ensure lids stay on tight and there's no cross-contamination between foods during transportation. Keep hot foods and cool foods separate to prevent the transfer of heat, which could lead to food spending time in the temperature danger zone. Make a note of the time that food spends out of its ideal storage temperature in travel and let your partner agency know how much time the food has remaining before it needs to be properly stored. Use a clean vehicle for transportation. Never place food in the same location as dirty clothes, sports equipment, trash, or chemicals, and always keep food and food containers six inches off of the floor. This is a hard and fast food safety rule that applies in storage and transportation to prevent critters from eating through food packaging and also from tra transferring floor microbes to kitchen counters. Use a cart like the one pictured here to help maintain the six inches in transportation. Knowing what you are recovering is essential in ensuring food safety. Be aware of these common food allergens. Milk, eggs, fish, shellfish, tree nuts, wheat, peanuts, and soybeans. Always clearly label any food that contains these allergens. Have a conversation with your partner agency on how they handle food allergies and if your chapter needs to take any extra precautions. For example, if they're a peanut-free facility, communicate with your food donor that you cannot accept any donations that may contain or have been cross-contaminated with peanuts. This conversation can also be a good time to listen to the dietary needs of your partner agency. Get to know what kind of food they are in most need of or how you can work with your food donor to meet their dietary and cultural needs with your recovery donations. All right, we made it to the end. Let's go over the important things to take away from this presentation and store in your memory. When doing recoveries, you must wear disposable gloves when handling food, a hat or hairnet with your hair tied back, a cloth or medical face mask to prevent the spread of COVID-19 and closed-toed shoes. It's a good idea to wear an Efren shirt, button, or hat with our logo on it to identify yourself to your food donor and partner agency staff. We have all become hand washing experts in the past year, so now is the time to really put all that practice to work. Wash your hands with warm water and soap for at least 30 seconds before you start the recovery and after touching anything that is not food or a clean food container. When picking the right food container, choose something that is clean, sanitized, and completely sealable for prepared foods, and a container that is clean, dry, and open for fresh produce. Repeat these things to yourself often to commit them to memory. The temperature danger zone is 40 to 140 degrees Fahrenheit, and food maintaining this internal temperature for more than two hours cannot be donated. Announce yourself in the kitchen by yelling hot and behind when appropriate. Keep food containers six inches off of the ground. Label all food containers with contents, allergens, the date made, expiration date, and storage instructions. The following information is important to have handy to refer to when doing food recoveries the definition of different date labels, and what your partner agency and state considers acceptable, the shelf life of common foods, and the top eight food allergens to be aware of. Throughout all of your food recovery efforts this year, make sure you are following CDC guidelines to protect yourself and others from COVID-19 by wearing your face mask, washing your hands frequently, and maintaining six feet of distance when possible. Now that you've completed watching the FRN food safety training video, it's time to take the quiz to prove your knowledge. This short quiz will confirm that you are trained in food safety by FRN and clear you to recover with your chapter. Be prepared to do it all again in a year because you know it's not lame, food safety. If you're interested in further certification in food safety, check out ServeSafe, an industry standard for food safety, or Always Food Safe, a food safety training program that gives FRN members a discount. These links will be sent in the completion email after you take the food safety quiz, but neither of these trainings are required by FRN. Thanks so much for tuning in. If you have any questions, you can always reach out to us at FRN National.